an ideal world, I start with a blank palette. And then I get to slowly add in all of the ingredients to make the world real. I'm Robert Kaplowitz, and I'm a sound designer. On every show, sound designers are responsible for putting together the sound system for the show, whether it be a musical or a play. And then sound designers are also responsible for the sound content in a play. So on, on a play, I often write music and also sound effects, uh, but also I'm then responsible for the reinforcement, for conveying the sound of the orchestra and the singers to the audience in a way that actually connects the audience to the fundamental text of the play, or the, the musical. The whole idea is that we are trying to sculpt an environment that you're not deeply conscious of, for the most part. In a musical, they, you know, the old joke is with a sound designer, if you notice the sound design, it's a bad design. In essence, the sound designer is trying not to be noticed, uh, while still very subtly often affecting you. I can draw attention to a moment in a play by turning, taking sound away. So sometimes I'm a silence designer. I kind of became a sound designer because I realized it was the thing I did best. Uh, I did theater in, in high school. We had a technical theater class, and so I took the technical theater class, and I fell in love with the theater, and I had gotten into electronic music. And so I was doing all of this sort of really, uh, sort of getting into esoteric sounds. And then, so with all of that, I then went to college. I was able to study design as a conceptual art. And when I, when I finished college, I went out and I, I was doing you know, anything I could to pay the bills, of course. And I was doing sound design and lighting design and set design. And as my work evolved, I began to realize that I didn't care enough about the details of lighting or scenery. But at the same time, computer editing was just coming out. And I remember spending hours zooming in you know, to a thousandth or a millionth of a second and literally seeing the waveform and going, oh, if I edit it right there, it'll sound perfect. And I said, oh, well, that's what I care about. That's what I'm excited by. There was a march, I remember, in uh, what I remember most clearly, I think it was March of 1995, and it was the first month I earned my entire living as a sound designer, and I designed five plays in one month. And I think it was a $300 fee and a $200 fee, and I remember thinking, oh, I've actually done it. I've, I've earned my living as a sound designer for this month. In order to be a sound designer, the very first thing absolutely is to listen. Um, but I think it's two kinds of listening. I think it's listening to what's there, and it's also listening to what's not there. It's listening to the space where you want to add, where you want to make more. What I'm working on is a, a production of, a, the play is called The Secret of Sherlock Holmes. Um, if you're a Sherlock Holmes fan, you'll know he plays the violin. What I'm trying to explore is the idea of making textures out of the violin that aren't necessarily music, per se. I think that my primary value as a designer, uh, you know, far above my composing skills, far above my listening skills, is, is my ability to read a play and understand what it is and what it's about and how to, how to help the audience connect into it. So when I'm working with a play that has a lot of sound dictated by the text, that's of course where I start. I want to make sure that I'm giving whatever the world of the play requires, um, anything from, you know, this guy's a cellist to there's dogs barking and trash cans rattling in the alleyway. The thing that gets interesting about that is how do I make that, take that to an artistically interesting level? But sometimes what's interesting is how do I transform that sonically? Do I make it, you know, can I make it rhythmic? Can I make it tonal? Can I, uh, can I find a way to make whatever these sounds are more connected to this particular world? This show that I just did um, with Annie Kaufman uh, called This Wide Night, I made music out of refrigerators. That's just your refrigerator droning. I took refrigerator drones and I recorded them and I put them in a sampler, which is a program that allows me to play sounds musically. And I wrote a score out of that. And I can have multiple samplers. You know, as sound designers, we get the, the freedom to play with that. And again, working in a way that the audience doesn't even know is happening. 
Get ready. Fall. When I'm doing a musical, I'm in no way responsible for the music. You know, on a musical, you've got an orchestrator, you've got, you've got a composer first, you've got an orchestrator, you've got a music director, you've got a lot of people on the team already who know very well what they're doing. And then there's me, and my job is to figure out what they're trying to achieve uh, within the score and find a way to bring that to the audience. In Fela, one of the things that I was really interested in doing was creating an environment that the audience was immersed in the sound, in the music. And that wasn't the, the music team's job, that was my job. That we were working in a Broadway theater there. And so the proscenium arch feels like an obstacle to some degree. And one of the things, you know, Marina Dragici, who did the set, really managed to pull the set into the house. And Robert Wurzel, who lit it, and Peter Negrini, who did the projections, all of them did a lot of work in the house. And I wanted to do the same thing, so that I created a sound system that could allow us to do a full surround of the vocals and the band without it ever seeming like the actors were behind you. And how do I do that, still maintain the power of Afrobeat, still give us a, a really clear sense of where everyone is in the room. Because, so how do I do that and still embrace the audience, wrap the audience with the sound? And the Tony Award goes to Robert Kaplowitz, Fela. I'm insanely grateful to have been a part of a company that made art. So to Sunil, to the Fela company, thank you. I think one of the reasons I love sound design is it gives me a chance to make an art that I am good at and that I love making in company of others. It's like a fission, you know, like a, like a nuclear reaction in this very positive little tiny way where, the, where a bloom of energy is created and a bloom of artistic creation happens. Is that I get to do it live and I get to have the response and I get to let the, the design and the soundscape, the score, as it were, develop in, in collaboration.